people don't like to change. Of course, we all have instances in which we desire a brief switch in routine to help escape the monotony of everyday life, but in reality, we enjoy staying comfortable. And really, there's nothing wrong with clinging to comfort and safety. It's completely normal. Wanting a productive and balanced routine, or a comfy mattress, or tasty food, or anything like that isn't wrong, or anything else that provides stability isn't wrong. The issue comes when we've established our snug lives and an obstacle comes our way, something that forces us to either change to meet the challenge or be hit unnecessarily hard by the oncoming blockade. Sometimes we make the necessary changes and manage to sidestep a collision, but in other cases, we get hit full force by inconveniences and learn a very valuable lesson. While it's crucial we learn from our mistakes to grow, some worldly issues aren't meant for us to take notes on. They're meant to be trials that we either pass or fail. As humans, we're constantly learning. Especially nowadays with social media and the internet, new studies on health and wellness can be read right after watching a political debate on YouTube. We can, with a few taps of the finger, discover a new movie or song or meme and then share it with friends. We stay informed and we stay in touch. Sure, there are plenty of instances where social media can exhaust us or worsen our moods, but I feel there's always sort of a euphoria from being up to date and feeling in the loop, so to say. Some of us are constantly current with new memes, some of us watch tons of documentaries, some of us like to look at videos about health and fitness. There's an unending amount of information to better our lives or encourage us to adopt new lifestyle practices. So why don't we embrace all of these healthy habits? Why don't we immediately buy a face mask marketed to clear our skin or download an app that claims it'll make us smarter? Why don't we cut bread out of our diet when we watch a video saying that gluten will rot our guts? Well, of course, we all have a certain level of disbelief for what's available online. We can see an ad for weight loss tea and know from prior knowledge that it isn't actually some magical tea that will help us lose weight. There's also, of course, heavily opinionated ideas that we just choose to ignore. For example, if someone claims these mint chocolate shakes are not only delicious, but will give you clear skin, I would steer clear from that shake not because I don't want clear skin, but because someone who thinks mint and chocolate go well together is objectively wrong. But no, really, whenever we watch something like a review or video essay, most of us will ignore the rantings of people bashing a piece of media that we happen to enjoy. But what about outside of that? Why do we choose not to change when video after video and study after study and blog post after blog post tell us that a particular change is favorable? Well, refer to the first sentence of this video. A life modification means our comfort is temporarily stripped away, leaving us vulnerable. We question whether or not an adjustment is really necessary. Some people will go into denial about a problem being present in the first place. Others may make the tiniest steps towards possible transition in order to avoid the most uncomfortable parts. Most often though, when it comes to the most troublesome dilemmas, we put it into the hands of others to change for us. This is especially true if the problem impacts more than just one person or a group of disparate people. In our excruciatingly individualistic society, the issues we rely on others to solve or outright deny exist must be really big and scary, huh? Now listen, relying on others isn't inherently bad. Most of us don't have time to save stray puppies in the city or cover up potholes in our neighborhood. Those problems are someone else's job to fix. Nobody should be asked to do everything, but everybody should be called to do something. There's a difference between not looking for stray puppies to save and blatantly ignoring them crying for help in a dumpster next to your apartment. But surely it's also important that we don't overextend ourselves to the point of change being more harmful than good and inevitably go back to our old ways, right? How do we know what to take and what to leave, and can we notice denial within ourselves? When is it appropriate to leave problems to other people? And with that array of questions, I can almost stop begging the topic of this video. But one more little nugget before that. To put it bluntly, we're in the midst of a crisis. Now, d don't make assumptions here. I haven't said what type of crisis yet, as there are many ones being thrown around these days. The crisis I'm talking about is one that I don't think has been named by a politician, a compassion crisis. Political polarization along with tribalism have made us more divided than ever before. Politics have always been divisive, sure, but it seems as though many of the divides nowadays are unnecessary and purely fear-driven. Now look, okay, this video is not a lecture on being nicer. This is simply a preface to the topic that I find necessary because I want to make one thing clear. I do not intend to call people out. I do not intend to call you out as an individual. Doing so would be hypocritical as I'm not perfect and neither is anybody else on the planet. It's ridiculous and it's narcissistic to project individual ideas of perfection onto others. I do, however, intend to discuss the actions and choices of people made and how these impact the world around us. This isn't out of hatred. Mild disappointment, perhaps, and maybe a bit of my own fear about the fate of humanity, but not hatred. The title of this video may make it difficult for you to hear me out, or for you to hear out the multiple sides I will analyze. 
But I ask you to try and stick with me, no matter who you are, why you're here, or what you thought this video would be. I, I don't want to judge. I want to try the best a singular person can to bring new light on what has been an increasingly divisive dilemma all over the world. Things are heating up, and we all know it. At this point, it's undeniable that the planet is warming. If you do not believe the objective fact that the Earth's temperature, on average, is rising to some degree, it's not my job to convince you of that. But spoiler alert, I, I kinda end up doing it anyway. But I believe most people recognize this. The issue is the five other essential questions most of us learned in second grade. We already know what, climate change, so now it's time to ask who, when, where, how. That's where people tend to disagree with each other, and for good reason. Climate science is confusing. The conflicting viewpoints of politicians are confusing. What are we to believe? I'm going to preface the first section of this video by saying this. I don't think climate change should be a political issue. Whatever your beliefs may be, the extremely charged politics surrounding the topic are unnecessary and ridiculous. It will become increasingly obvious why I believe this as the video progresses. But for now, just so I can keep you all on board, I think most of us can agree that the claims of plastic straws being true symbols of freedom and necessary for human life are ridiculous, and the claims that every person can live without a car or just buy an electric vehicle on a whim are also ridiculous. For this portion of the video, despite how much I dislike generalizing it, it's generally safe to assume that people who lean left politically want national and international action on climate change, while those on the right do not, or at least, don't want very much. If this does not align with you, then that's fine, but it's generally accepted to be this way currently and it's easier for this part of the video to use the generalization. I intend to try and give the best arguments of each side, so just stick with me. With that out of the way, let's look into the politics of climate change. The 2020 election here in the United States is going to be pretty important, let's say that. Our current president is controversial to say the absolute least, and there's a lot of unrest amongst voters. President Donald Trump has allowed a vast amount of environmental protection scalebacks over his presidency. Notably, he allowed Obama's clean power plan to be halted, and he pulled the United States out of the Paris Climate Accord. There are a myriad of other policies and restrictions he's trying to lessen currently or already has, such as relaxing air pollution limits, dismantling wildlife protection policies, and allowing the fossil fuel industry at greater leeway in carrying out its mining and manufacturing. If you don't know what this means, or are unsure of the specifics, don't worry, I'm going to explain most of this stuff very soon. My first point, though, is that many environmentally conscious people are unhappy with the Trump administration for lessening environmental protection. And, as it usually goes with politics, if one disagrees with an incumbent's policies, they'll look to the challengers for better ones. In this case, most environmentally concerned people are looking to the left for these policies. So what I want to do first and foremost is go over the policies that are challenging Trump's policies. This opposition is most easily found within the Democratic presidential candidates. As of right now, the presidential race has been narrowed down to Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Despite this, I think it's incredibly important to analyze what all of the candidates were proposing before they dropped out or got voted out in order to pinpoint the similarities and differences. It's crucial to understand the trends of the most popular wide-scale climate plans because it is only then that we can firstly consider the practicality of these plans and secondly identify the concerns that the right has with these plans and climate policies in general. I'm using what's going on in the United States largely because, well, I'm American, so it's what I'm most up to date with, but also because the policies proposed here present many ideas that are discussed internationally. Not to mention, with how much carbon the United States produces, the world is sort of waiting on us when it comes to these issues right now. So let's go over this stuff. The Democratic primary debates did mention climate change quite a bit, but not as much as many climate activists were hoping for. And as is the trend with all issues in the debates, unfortunately, there's a higher usage of buzzwords and bold promises rather than policy specifics. So, being curious to learn more about their specific policies, I turned to the internet to find out which candidates are slash were big on climate change action, which ones aren't, if any of them have specific policies, etc. So let's go over that. This article, published in April of 2019, summarizes a lot of the information about the candidates right at the beginning of campaigning. It doesn't include Joe Biden, but we'll get to him in a minute. To summarize, all of the candidates agree on getting the United States back into the Paris Agreement. All of them believe in investing in clean energy. All of them agree with reinstating Obama-era climate plans, with most of them claiming they want to take those farther. This is important, so keep this in mind. Some notable disagreements come with the issue of using nuclear energy to decarbonize and the ethics of employing a carbon tax. 
Cory Booker, John Delaney, and Andrew Yang all say they fully support nuclear power, while candidates such as Marianne Williamson, Jay Inslee, Julian Castro, and Tim Ryan are sort of iffy on the issue. Meanwhile, Tulsi Gabbard is blatantly opposed to nuclear energy, and Bernie Sanders is also supposedly. According to these two sites, one of them being Joe Biden's own website, Biden is in full support of nuclear energy. Many of the candidates, like Pete Buttigieg, Delaney, Kirsten Gillibrand, and Yang, support a carbon tax. Meanwhile, Inslee, Castro, and A.B. Klobuchar are open to it, but seem to collectively view it as a first step or a method that should not be overutilized. Many of the candidates' campaigns didn't comment, and Tulsi refers to her off-climate plan, something we'll go over shortly. So, let me establish the plans I'm going to cover. Well, the standout acts, in my opinion, are Tulsi's Off Fossil Fuels Act, Inslee's 100% Clean Energy Plan, and, of course, the Green New Deal and the extensions of it, which many candidates endorse if they don't have their own specific plans. I chose the first two specifically because they seem to be the most overt ones that aren't just complete rehashes of the Green New Deal. And while Jay Inslee was out of the race pretty early, he was basically the Green candidate, so I want to go over what his plan was anyways. All right, stick with me a little longer, guys. I know this isn't the most interesting aspect of the climate debate, but it is pretty important. So first off, the Green New Deal. This is the one most people have probably heard of, and depending on who you are, you'll either say it's famous or infamous. The Green New Deal is a bill proposed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a New York congresswoman, that first and foremost states that global warming is being caused by human activity. It also cites severe income inequality, systematic oppression of minorities, and limited socioeconomic mobility as reasons to revamp the economy in a manner that doesn't harm the environment. The bill aims for net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and strives to reach this goal by creating high wage jobs and clean energy, supporting sustainable farming, and by eliminating pollution and greenhouse gas emissions as much as technologically feasible. It also looks to provide higher education to all economic groups, healthcare for all, etc. This bill is largely focused on addressing economic problems in the United States, only with the added benefit of using green tech to do so. The Green New Deal has a lot of similarities to other ideas proposed by different candidates, which is largely why I explained the basics of it first. Many of the Democratic candidates support this, and if not this, something very similar. Bernie Sanders is one prominent candidate who supports the Green New Deal. His website lays out more specifics in relation to the Green New Deal, and these include allowing for a just transition for people losing fossil fuel jobs to policy change, creating 20 million jobs, supporting small farms slash transitioning large farms to more green practices, and more. It also aims to spend $16.3 trillion, which is a lot, but most climate plans are pretty expensive. His plan does detail exactly where the money will be spent, such as here where it says the plan will provide $2.09 trillion in grants to low- and moderate-income families and small businesses to trade in their fossil fuel-dependent vehicles for new electronic vehicles. This is only one example. Overall, Bernie's plan is the Green New Deal with a list of more specific goals, which is appealing to many environmentalists. It calls for a climate justice resiliency fund, which would help people who will be most impacted by climate change, funding land and water conservation, and a lot, a lot more. If you want me to be totally honest, there's a lot of good specifics in this plan, and it's very much worth a read if you have the time. But there's so much here, it would probably take me five more pages of script to cover it all, and that's not what we're here for. Not yet, anyways. So just keep in mind for now that Sanders' plan is the Green New Deal with a more specified to-do list and bigger spending plans, even though he and many others believe the plan will end up being cheaper than climate mitigation will be in the future. There are some key problems and concerns people have with the Green New Deal that can be applied to other plans that I'm going to explain. Next, I want to explore Tulsi's Off Fossil Fuels Act, which was actually first introduced in 2017. This act strives for 100% clean energy by 2035. It says, By 2027, 80% of electricity sold must be generated from clean energy sources. 80% of new vehicle sales from manufacturers must be sales of zero emission vehicles. And 80% of train rail lines and train engines must be electrified. By 2035, 100% of electricity must be generated from clean energy sources, 100% of vehicle sales from manufacturers must be zero emission vehicles, and 100% of train rail lines and train engines must be electrified. There is a focus on how this goal will help create high-paying jobs and stimulate the economy. There are mentions, similarly to the Green New Deal, about the impact of climate change specifically on lower income and minority communities. The Off Fossil Fuels Act differentiates from the Green New Deal and its focus, because while it does talk about new green jobs and helping vulnerable communities, there are no specifics on healthcare for all, education for all, and other non-climate related reforms. So think of this act as a slice of the Green New Deal with 15 years shaved off the clean energy goal. 
Next is Jay Inslee's 100% Clean Energy Plan. Again, this is pretty similar to the previous two, but I wanted to include it because Inslee was the most prominent climate activist in the race, so it's important to see how his plan fares by comparing it to others. Inslee's plan strives for 100% clean electricity by 2035, 100% clean transportation by 2030, and 100% clean buildings by 2030. The plan includes a ban on coal power starting in 2025, creating American-made zero-emission vehicles, tax incentives for investment, etc. There appear to be more year-specific goals in this plan than the others. Again, there is a mention of protecting communities harmed by climate change and those who will be impacted by losing jobs in non-clean energy industries, but no specific plan to ameliorate this. Similarly to Tulsi's, this plan does not include the number of requests the Green New Deal does, but has similar ideals on climate specifically. So why did I force this long explanation of specific climate plans on you all, especially when some of them aren't even relevant anymore? Well, I think it's quite obvious that these three plans are pretty close ideas under different names. The Green New Deal is much more grandiose in its goals than Tulsi's and Inslee's, but theirs also have 15 or so years shaved off of 100% clean energy deadlines. The main goals are basically the same and have the same intentions, although it wouldn't be incorrect to argue that AOC's plan is much more about changing the American economy than it is about green energy specifically. Keep in mind that many people on the left look to plans like these for climate action, because now we must ask ourselves this. How likely is our country to succeed in passing these plans and acting on them? Well, we can look to the Green New Deal for an answer on that. Remember earlier how I mentioned people having problems with certain aspects of the plan? Well, the first of these is cost. Many people are concerned over the costs of a plan like the Green New Deal and the burden it would put on taxpayers. Trump claims it would cost $100 trillion. Some say it could actually save taxpayers, and AOC herself said it would be expensive. And of course, Bernie Sanders plans to spend $16.3 trillion. Along with number concerns, there's the simple criticism that the plan is much too idealistic. In March of 2019, the Green New Deal didn't even make it past the procedural vote in the Senate. This vote brought forward concerns about the Green New Deal being socialist and unethical towards lower to middle class Americans. Now, part of the reason this vote failed can be linked to Democrats not voting for or even voting against advancing the plan due to the belief that the voting environment was unfair. This failure is also because there's a Republican majority in the United States Senate at the moment. It's undeniable that this was not the best voting environment for the plan. Democrats worried about being labeled socialists and Republicans not wanting what they believe to be a socialist plan voted on at all does not necessarily mean there won't be a better opportunity in the future. However, at the same time, the vote to vote for the Green New Deal failed by a landslide. And maybe it's just me, but those odds don't seem very good. As much as plans like this appeal to climate activists, as far as realism goes, is it truly possible for anything like the Green New Deal to not only be voted on, but be voted on to be voted on? Don't get me wrong, if Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader in the United States currently, loses his place as Majority Leader in 2020 and Trump doesn't regain presidency, there's a possibility another vote on the Green New Deal will happen. Still, though, even if it were voted into law, the plan itself is just an outline and would require many more specific acts to reach its goals, those of which we are only starting to see come out or even be talked about. I think at the very least, it's safe to say that with the current political climate and the loftiness of the Green New Deal and plans like it, these policies are unlikely to come to full fruition, if a seed is even planted at all. Don't think this is me denouncing these plans, by the way. Right now, I simply want to explain them and preface some of the reasons why they may not be popular, specifically on the right. So, what else is there? Well, there are a couple smaller acts and ideas from the candidates, as well as past legislation we can look at. Some of you may notice I haven't mentioned Elizabeth Warren at all. This is partially due to her lack of specific answers about climate change in the previous New York Times article. That article and others, however, say she supports the Green New Deal, as many other candidates do, and we just discussed the likelihood of that plan being put into place right now. Despite this, she does mention an act she's proposed called the Climate Risk Disclosure Act. This act would force companies to disclose their climate-harming practices to the public. It also makes it necessary for corporations to publicize their actions combating climate change. The Climate Risk Disclosure Act justifies this idea by saying disclosing this information will be useful to investors who don't want their money given to non-green companies, or in reality, companies that may lose a lot of money if green tech begins to rise and fossil fuel usage is phased out. To quote right from the act, Companies have a duty to disclose financial risks that climate change presents to their investors, leaders, and insurers. The intention of this act is to speed up the switch to clean energy without a tax to the people and without enormous government spending. This is definitely a smaller scale idea than the previous plans. Now, obviously, this is just a single act. Considering Warren's support of the Green New Deal, this may just be one step towards the ultimate goal of meeting those plans' requirements. 
This is also a direct attack on corporations, which is something that the left tends to favor when talking about climate change. This is due to the fact that many fossil fuel companies and other industries that pollute heavily go unchecked or underchecked. Many Democrats and leftists want corporate accountability for climate destruction, so this bill will probably appeal to a lot of them. There's only one issue with this. Corporations don't want to be held accountable. Well, obviously, what else is new? That's why people want this act in the first place. Yeah, yeah, of course, except they really, really don't want to be held accountable. Yeah. I don't think it's much of a secret at this point that politicians love accepting money from big business, of course with the small price to pay of having their voting habits basically controlled by huge industries. Some enjoy the gas money a little more than others, although no political party is excluded from the agribusiness fund. <sighs> now look, okay, this information is hard to verify, just as most numbers on the internet are at this point, so take all of these lobbying numbers with a heavy grain of salt. However, my point still stands that lobbying does play a huge part in the voting habits of all politicians, but especially the right when it comes to climate action. I mean, come on, most oil and gas companies believe in human-caused global warming. They would just rather we invest in carbon capture, slap a small carbon tax on their products, and call it a day. In 2014, Shell and other major global oil companies convened to form the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative to fund clean energy ventures, and in 2017, a consortium of global Fortune 500 companies, including Shell, Total, ExxonMobil, and BP, joined with a handful of green groups to launch the Climate Leadership Council to advocate in the U.S. for a carbon tax that reflects the conservative principles of free market and limited government. A related lobbying group has spent several million dollars lobbying Congress for this proposal. These aren't necessarily bad ideas inherently, but most environmentalists don't appreciate this kind of enormous compromise, nor do they appreciate the lobbying. Either companies participate in things like this, or they focus on buying time to expand their market to other industries. Some firms, like ExxonMobil, are positioning themselves to squeeze the last lucrative years from the oil economy while arguing to shareholders that they will be able to sell all their oil. Shell is charting a path that will allow it to continue to profit from oil and gas while simultaneously expanding its plastics business and diversifying into electrical power. This doesn't come without consequence, though, because in recent years, public opinion on fossil fuel companies has plummeted, and investors sometimes team up to give companies ultimatums. My point here is that fossil fuel corporations and fossil fuel-supported industries aren't likely to ever do enough for climate activists. And my overarching point here is, again, that an act like the Climate Risk Disclosure Act has its obstacles in getting passed, especially since it would be a much more binding agreement. I personally believe this one has a higher likelihood of getting passed, but again, it's still mostly depending on who's in office, who has the Senate majority seat, the legitimacy of the votes, how much lobbying takes place, etc. There are still a lot of big ifs here, as there are with many other potential climate acts too. So now will be the time to acknowledge the last two large-scale agreements on climate action, those being the Paris Climate Accord and the Clean Power Plan. As much as I would like to go over more examples of smaller acts and legislation, it would be nearly impossible to cover everything of this nature, so let's move on to these instead. Remember earlier how I mentioned that all of the candidates for the election want to bring back Obama-era climate reforms? Well, that's the Clean Power Plan. I guess you could say it's the Paris Agreement too, but that's an international agreement. For those of you who don't know, the Paris Climate Agreement is an international agreement that seeks to keep the global average temperature beneath 2 degrees Celsius. Every country who has signed the agreement is supposed to reduce their emissions as much as feasibly possible. The agreement also aims to increase transparency about climate action and protect nations from the effects of climate change. It's a very basic, not overly binding agreement. The United States is technically not a part of this plan right now, though, due to the fact that we're leaving it under the Trump administration. The justification for this is concern over lost jobs, costs of meeting the Accord's requirements, and disadvantaging the American economy. Trump said in a statement on the agreement in 2017, the Paris Accord would undermine our economy, hamstring our workers, weaken our sovereignty, impose unacceptable legal risks, and put us at a permanent disadvantage to the other countries of this world. Many other countries, well, actually most other countries in the world, are a part of this plan. Now that we've gone over the Paris Agreement, let's get back to the Clean Power Plan. The Clean Power Plan is a plan that Obama started in 2015. This plan seeks, unlike many of the current plans, to make fossil fuel energy cleaner. As in, this plan has no goal of net zero carbon emissions by year blank, or 100% clean energy by year blank. The original idea was for this plan to be fully in place by 2030. When the Clean Power Plan is fully in place in 2030, 
carbon pollution from the power sector will be 32% below 2005 levels, securing progress and making sure it continues. This plan seeks to make existing coal plants cleaner, replace high-emitting energy with lower-emitting energy, and also invest in and increase the use of clean energy sources. It also seeks to work on a state level, with states submitting plans to reduce carbon emissions by a certain date. This was likely in order to allow states that may rely on fossil fuels to adapt more easily, as well as a method of getting the plan to appeal to Republicans, who, if you don't know, are big proponents of states' rights. There was also a mention of tax incentives for early investment in wind and solar energy in the plan. A final carbon reduction layout from each state was supposed to be finished no later than September 6, 2018. This may have happened if not for the immense amount of lawsuits the plan found itself wrapped up in. Industry heads, multiple states, and the previous leader of the EPA, Scott Pruitt, are among some of these sewers. This also may have happened if President Trump had not allowed Pruitt to stop the plan. The Clean Power Plan, which I'm sure everyone can agree is much less demanding than the plans we've previously discussed, still got repealed, at least for the time being. Y'all have to keep in mind, when this plan came out, Obama was still in office. Now, obviously in the past two years, concern about climate change has really heightened due to the IPCC report, which I will be going over later for those of you who don't know what it is. It's not like there's no reason for the current climate action plans to be more bold. But even despite this, the EPA was repeatedly sued for what is, objectively, a less restrictive plan on carbon reduction. There is a large part of me that doubts this plan would have gone forward even if a Democratic president was elected in 2016, even when the IPCC report inevitably came out. And frankly, I doubt it would be instated very long if Obama were president now as opposed to a few years ago, even with a lot more people concerned about the supposed effects of global warming. Sure, Trump's opinion that Earth's warming is not human caused at all, and it's a foreign scheme, sure hasn't helped environmentalists, but even before Trump, even before the right gained power, the USA wasn't particularly climate friendly. But should it be? As I was researching information on the clean power plan being phased out, I found an article about it that had a line that intrigued me. So is this just another angry white man, lashing out at the global climate conspiracy, determined to turn the clock back to the golden age of anthracite? Alright, don't shut this video off yet, I promise this leads somewhere. This quote links to an <clears throat> study about the link between conservative white men and climate denial. We find that conservative white males are significantly more likely than our other Americans to endorse denialist views on all five items, and that these differences are even greater for those conservative white males who self-report understanding global warming very well. <sighs> now listen, obviously this is largely based on self-reported data, and it's also just a survey, and I don't need to explain to you guys that this is not the best resource at all to cite in what is supposed to be a non-opinion piece, but it's absolutely hilarious to me, so leave me alone. In all seriousness though, I think this is a good place to explore why many current climate plans and past climate plans have been so heavily rejected by people on the right. Is it really just angry white men? Well, for the short answer, no. It seems to be a trend, perhaps a stereotype at this point, but no. There are a multitude of reasons why climate denial is rampant in America. To give a basis, however, I do want to go over the IPCC report mentioned earlier. This is the climate report that everybody's been talking about, even if they don't know it. It's the reason why everyone is officially very worried about our climate. So I think it's extremely important in order to determine if there are valid climate denial views or if the IPCC report is actually as foreboding as people make it out to be. So the report. To summarize, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a United Nations organization that reports climate science, affirms that anthropogenic global warming is real and significant. The report states, first and foremost, that human activities are estimated to have caused approximately one Celsius of global warming. It also says that the current level of human emissions will most likely not cause warming above 1.5 degrees soon, but it will still have long-term impacts on changes in the climate. The IPCC actually does say in its summary that reaching and sustaining net zero global anthropogenic CO2 emissions and declining net non-CO2 radiated forcing would halt anthropogenic global warming on multi-decadal timescales. So there is a place where this common goal of net zero emissions in current climate policy is coming from. The report goes on to talk about how the extent of temperature rise and global warming related climate changes, i.e. sea level rise, will largely depend on the level of human emissions and how much action is taken to reduce them. It also goes over predictions about the state of Earth if warming reaches 1.5 to 2 Celsius. 
One aspect of this report I saw repeated frequently was the idea that 1.5 degrees of warming would cause significantly less harm to humans than 2 degrees, so it's generally okay to assume that when I summarize effects, they are believed to be worse at 2 degrees than 1.5 degrees. Some of the predicted outcomes of warming are sea level rise that will cause millions of people to relocate, ocean acidity that's a threat to marine biomes, decreases in biodiversity among certain land and ocean environments, increases in heat waves, threats to indigenous livelihoods, and much more. If you don't fully know what these terms mean or exactly what this all entails, I will be going over most of this stuff periodically, so stick with me. Overall, the IPCC report claims that anthropogenic global warming is a threat to humans. The report summary suggests that reduction in carbon and methane emissions will slow the warming and its impacts. Another affirmation from the text is that some of the human-caused warming may incite more natural carbon and methane releases from Earth that could further warming. It declares, Pathways limiting global warming to 1.5 Celsius with no or limited overshoot would require rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, land, urban and infrastructure, and industrial systems. The report summary then goes on to mention some potential methods of limiting warming, such as carbon capture, sustainable livestock, new green technology, etc. There is a statement about how rapid changes towards a green economy may cause trouble for heavily fossil fuel dependent areas, so it's not ignoring this potential issue. The report also estimates that the reforms needed will cost about $2.4 trillion. Overall, though, the report still says it is absolutely necessary to rapidly change fossil fuel usage in order to limit warming. Avoiding overshoot and reliance on future large-scale deployment of carbon dioxide removal CDR, can only be achieved if global CO2 emissions start to decline well before 2030. Again, the year 2030 in politicians' policies is actually coming from something. Somewhat strangely, the report also talks about how limiting warming leaves better potential for eradication of poverty and social justice, which may be due to its predictions that vulnerable populations will be impacted. Also, I am referencing the summary for policymakers if you haven't noticed already, so that may be why this is here, because it's meant to give policy ideas based on the science. Anyways, there's also a mention of adaptation methods that ensure the impacts of climate change won't severely impact human life. These may be necessary if, say, for example, sea level rise gets severe and coastal areas need better, taller seawalls. In conclusion, the most recent IPCC report states that international cooperation and rapid reduction of fossil fuel emissions are crucial for mitigating the negative effects of human-caused climate change. Is there any valid reason to deny anthropogenic, aka human-caused, global warming at this point? A lot of people's immediate reactions will be no. The scientific consensus is that our carbon emissions are causing climate change. The IPCC report concludes we are causing global warming and that's that. This isn't even bad reasoning. I mean, who am I, just the everyday non-scientist, to even suggest a scientific consensus is wrong? To make it clear, I'm not saying that at all, but anyone even mildly skeptical of the science is bound to have felt this way. We should be able to rely on scientists to tell us the facts, and the idea of picking apart the facts is daunting to most. Again, who am I to say that everyone else is wrong? And I imagine all skeptical people are sick of being demonized. I imagine that they're all sick of asking questions about the science and getting only hostility in response. So here we have these people who accept the science because, well, it's science, and another group of people who question the science's legitimacy. And it's difficult to find a dissection of either side's positions, at least in any nuanced fashion. All of this is exactly why I've been hesitant to delve into the science myself. I'm not an expert, and there's plenty I don't understand about climate, and why should I bother looking into it when I should trust those who dissect studies and do climate research for a living? It shouldn't be anybody's responsibility to interpret all of this information in detail. I mean, the whole point of a consensus is that the vast majority of scientists agree, right? If I'm advocating for policy change and promoting what's assumed to be the real science of climate change, is it my job to do anything else? It isn't, and it shouldn't be any of our jobs. But, unfortunately, I can't help myself. I've waited for a long time, and I've done many Google searches along the lines of the absolute truth about global climate change, or how can we be absolutely 100% certain without a single doubt that humans are causing climate change, hoping for a definitive answer. I've watched so many videos and read so many articles, and while my ego was happy to be constantly reassured of my moral high ground in the climate debate, continuously reminded that climate change is the problem and governments aren't fixing it fast enough, through all of this self-righteousness, my heart was suffering. Because my heart knew it's impossible for all the skeptics to be crazy. It's impossible for all of them to just be angry white men trying to turn the clock back to the golden age of anthracite. 
It's impossible that all of the actual scientists on the other side of the climate debate are wrong, and it's impossible that all of them are just in it to promote a political agenda, just as it's impossible that every scientist part of the anthropogenic global warming consensus is unbiased and pure-hearted. Unfortunately, I just can't bring myself to believe that, and you should neither. So maybe it isn't my place to be analyzing the science. I don't doubt the possibility that I will overlook a crucial piece of evidence. I do not ignore the fact that I have my own accidental bias, considering I've always cared about the environment and environmental protection and climate change action. You can call me selfish for not leaving the work to the professionals. I wouldn't blame you for that. Honestly, I can't say I disagree with you. All of my middle school and high school teachers sure hated me asking questions. Oh boy, let's not go there. Anyways, even if tainted by my own personal flaws, my only goal is to shed some light on an extremely complicated, frustrating and divisive issue. I just want the truth, and I can say with complete certainty that I can bring at least some truth to the table. Looking into both sides of any debate is crucial to understanding an issue and becoming a well-rounded person. I imagine some of you are climate skeptics. I imagine some of you are not, and I'm sure that there are some people here that are neutral on the issue or don't know much about it. However strong your opinions may be, whatever you believe, I and maybe this is a grandiose claim, but I believe it anyways, believe everyone could get something valuable out of these videos. As I've already said, I want you to delve into the science with me. I want you to hear the skeptics out, hear the environmentalists out, hear me out. That's all I can ask for. I'll try to make it interesting, informative, and hopefully a bit fun at times. All right, so with that out of the way, why do people deny human-caused global warming? Rather than just focusing on obvious falsehoods and the easy-to-refute global warming isn't happening argument, I'd like to focus on some of the solid counterpoints I've found. Because despite what many environmentalists say, there are a lot of counter-arguments to go over. Climate science is considered to be settled, right? Well, maybe not. 